What's going on, Christine? I'm cold. Your energy is low today. What's the situation? I just took a nap and I'm cold and I'm tired. I understand. I'm going to put on my comfy. How was your napsicle? Was it nice? Oh, she's... Wow. Okay. (laughs) She's, uh, for folks who can't see, she's really struggling to get a blanket, robe, snuggy, comfy thing over her. But also, I think what Who she are you forgot. you calling struggling? Uh, she, you look like a little marshmallow man just became the marshmallow man for the first time ever. Whee! Oh my gosh. Now I feel better. Is your your headphones, they're not, the cord isn't in the way in there? <laughs> Who, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You look, you do look very snuggly, but uh, <sighs> how, how are you? Now do you I feel better? I feel much better. I think about 30 minutes in, I'm going to be like, I'm hot. And then. Everything's a thousand com- percent coming I've, back off. <laughs> I've never seen anyone wear one of those and like just enjoy a full day in it. It's, it's always hard. It really it, feels like immediately it's great and then it very quickly becomes unenjoyable. Yeah. I and it's such a shame because when you walk into a store and you touch something with that oh, material, you go, it's, <gasps> it's so soft. It's life changing, really. Uh, yeah. And then you you have to take into account the like in less than thirty minutes you're gonna never want it on your body. <laughs> right. Like if I were the type to go out and sleep out outdoors uh-huh. for oh. whatever reason, I would probably just bring this like uh let's just say in a survival situation right you have it (laughs) this would be my in my emergency kit my emergency (laughs) kit would be six feet wide because i would need to to pack this entire blanket um but yeah i know i'm good sorry for the low energy i'm just i'm just uh we had our first leg of the tour we did and uh i got home at i traveled like 13 hours and I'm, i'm home and i'm tired and uh, I think it was the downswing of all that emotional labor we put and physical labor we put into the show. So Ooh. much emotional labor. I I think it was. Um, I, I hey, so first of all, we did such a good job. We did such a good Em, job. I'm so proud of you. We did. I'm really happy with it. Me too. I didn't. I not that I didn't think I'd be happy with it, but I'm shocked. It was at- impossible to imagine that we would be like content and done with putting it together by now i've i mean so just to give people some by the time people listen to this they're like the shows have are like already done (laughs) you're you're over over now yeah (laughs) but uh when uh, up until literally the day of our first show we were still tweaking the script so like we we, were in the hotel like frantically finishing yeah christine was re-editing volume on a on a clip and everything and so it's um it's wild because since so we investigated for the first time this location back in august and in the summer and since august all the way into mid-february it has there's always been something looming yeah because yeah looming and consuming as i say and so it but either it was watching the footage or editing the footage or writing the script and like so all the way up and then there's like this buildup of what people even like all the hardware so it's just it's amazing to actually have seen it on stage and it all worked and it it's just totally and it feels like now what (laughs) i know i'm I'm like stressing out because i feel like there's something i have to do and there's nothing right now so i have to clean my trash pile do you want to see it it's horrifying (gasps) can i show you my trash pile look behind me i'm just gonna oh well that looks like clothes not trash it's an adhd laundry monster pile oh well mine's literal trash and there's actually moldy tomato soup here so it's pretty gnarly a show and tell from you about like all the gnarly trash that's in your room. I don't know that like people would be I think it would be like funny for a minute and then people would be like oh this has gotten really dark and sad I don't think I care about anyone else's opinion on this I think <laughs> I just <laughs> because here's the thing I, even I just went to go visit Christine before our first show so we could rehearse mm-hmm. and um we I, all I wanted to do was take this one nap in this one spot in Christine's house. It's my favorite spot in the whole world to take a nap. And I feel like when I sleep on it, it's like it's like a little sun. It's like a little spot. It's a little bench in a sunny area. It feels like I'm a, like I'm a cat and I can sleep on like the warm part of the floor. That's what it feels like. 
And all I wanted right. to do is take this nap. Right. But Christine refused because apparently her room yep. was so dirty she didn't want me to see it and I wouldn't be able to sleep on the bench anyway. I, I mean, like it's not even that justice. I didn't want you to see it. Oh, I mean, it's not even that I didn't want you to see it. It's that like it's you literally physically wouldn't be able to fit on this bench because it's <laughs> covered in. I mean, like I'm like here's the tomato soup I mentioned. Um, <laughs> it's just like there's just a bag of batteries. I don't know. That's okay. fun. Actually, um, I don't. I feel like more people, more people than either of us realize, probably just have a bag of batteries somewhere. I feel like I you're say, room- right. It would be an excellent... Okay, so when we did... Um, like, here's uh, a postcard of Carrot People. <laughs> Is that from Eva? That looks like an Eva purchase. It does, but it's not. I don't I don't know. I, I don't know. It's just here. <laughs> you would do excellent all over again on that game, Let's Make a Deal or whatever. I when miss he, it. When he was like, what do you have in your bag? And he just picks a random item. In your room, you'd probably win every time. Oh, I'd win every time. I mean, usually in my bag, too, even. I remember he said a deck of cards, and I was like, shit, they're in my other purse. I do have a deck of cards, <laughs> but they're in my other purse, which I lost somewhere in my house. But anyway, it's a <laughs> it's a shit show. Like, here's that Panera from when we were rehearsing. I mean, literally, like, this place is... Uh, I'm, like, surrounded by trash. So I guess that is answer to my question. Oh, my God. There is a plate, a dirty plate with a dirty fork and two batteries on it. As if I've been just, like, <laughs> snacking on batteries. Like, why are they on there? I don't it's know. It's like you're the iron giant and you just have a midnight, <laughs> midnight snack. Anyway, not to complain, but it, just to say, I guess I do now have a project for myself, which... Well, uh, I love it about you. I think it's very charming. Oh, so. great. I'm glad. You tell Blaze because he's pretty much over it. Um, okay, how but are then you? you? I'm good. You all, by the way, tell Allison the same thing because... <laughs> The two of them really do need to text each other about how disgusting what they are. What a charmer. Um, how am I? I'm I'm okay. I I th- I don't really know how I feel. I'm in like a weird middle ground because I really have I really am so proud of us with the show and I um we've been stressing about it for so long that now mm-hmm. I'm in this like weird like gray space of like, oh, well, we're good. Like that so I don't know. I mean, just like what we were talking about, I I feel kind of I'm like glad I it's need not to just be doing me. something. I felt very like bizarre for a few days, so I'm glad it's not just me. I feel like I've earned burnout and ha- don't have it yet, and so yeah. I'm just kind of in this weird halt and like um, yeah. But I still I'm I feel very good. I'm excited with my health stuff. I got I'm finally wearing jewelry. Please, everyone, Excuse hold me? your breath. I got one of those like medical rings. Oh! Oh, did you uh, use promo code Beach? <laughs> no. What? No, I did. What? Ri- what ring? What ring does Beach or Sandy work with? The Aura ring. God damn it! I should have used. Ri- I should have used Beach. That's okay. Um, well, if you ever need a testimony, if you don't have one yourself, I can tell you all about it. But so far, I really like it. So um, I'm feeling like I'm like being constantly monitored, which makes my anxiety go down. That's and... good. Anyway, yeah, I'm feeling like I'm on the up and up currently. So I'm so how- happy about that. How are you in your big marshmallow body pillow? I'm actually wearing? thriving right now. I feel, oh. really, <laughs> I feel really poofy and like fine. Great. Great. Excellent. Uh, one might even say excellent tante. One might and one could. And one, one should. Could, and one should. I have a story for you today. I think she's a quickie, but I, I like her anyway. Can't wait. Um, and this is the story... Oh, by the way, were you ready for a story? Did you feel like you needed to chat about anything? No? We're good? No, thank you for asking. I'm, uh, I feel like I'm just, I'm like at my, my peak right now. I'm ready for, to, I'm ready to absorb your tale. Good. I felt bad. I just really dove in there out of nowhere. Usually, No, we... no. You asked me how I was. You were, okay. you were very gentle. I'm excited. I haven't, um, uh, I haven't done my, my. My, I'm calling them my mins and my sups, my vitamins and supplements. Um, oh, <laughs> I, was like, I really now I've really <laughs> lost you. OK, I haven't done them yet today and I'm excited to do a vitamin minute with you after. OK, uh, I haven't done recording. mine either. We've been doing vitamin minutes together, everybody. Where we take a minute. Actually, we've our... never taken them together. We've always tried to take a We just keep missing each other. And, sh- and Christine will be like, you want to take a vitamin minute? And I'm like, oh, I already did my mins and sups. I can't do it. But <laughs> Mins and sups. Anyway, we'll do our mins and sups afterwards. And maybe during our uh, Patreon after chat, we'll have our vitamin minute. Oh, how fun. 
Nice. For nobody okay. but us. <laughs> for nobody. But, hey, if you're uh, in your 30s and discovering men's and subs for the first time, <laughs> you can join us on our Vita Minute. Yeah. We can all take them together. Also, while we're at it, reminder to take a sip of water right now, all you thirsty, thirsty little does, people. Does iced coffee count? Mm, sure. Say hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, okay. we should ask. You're drinking iced coffee. I'm drinking um, a tea from our Anaheim green room. Oh, how cute. Oh, I remember you took those out and then refused to give me a coconut water, but I'm over it. That's true. Okay, here's the story. Here is the Tallman House. Mm. Uh, it is in Wisconsin, but there's also another Tallman House in Wisconsin, so it gets confusing. Okay. Um, there is a Lincoln Tallman House, which is not the one we're talking about today. Okay. We're talking about just good old Tallman House. And the house was built in 1982. And four years later, Alan and Debbie, they buy it uh, as their dream house. Uh oh. And I know it always starts <laughs> as a dream house. It's never good. I feel like when and when I'm telling a ghost story, if I start out with it was their dream home, that is the equivalent to true crime. She lit up every lit room. up she a walked- room. Mm-hmm. She lit up a room in her dream home. Things are about to get so bad. Things are about to get so upsetting because oh no nothing but high hopes over here what so, let me guess was bill or whatever his name is a fucking pillar of the community too he might as well have been but so <laughs> far i mean he is an upstanding citizen as far as i can tell and then things just go that downhill can't be real good. quick ah <sighs> so they buy their dream house alan works nights at his job so debbie is often home alone at night with their two going on three kids so they have a seven-year-old son um, and then they have, eventually they have two daughters. Both of them are babies in the story. The oldest is their seven-year-old son. Okay. And I will say, I, I don't know why I'm impressed. I just feel like this doesn't happen very often, but the Tallmans to this day have done a really good job of protecting their kids' identities and n- I, I couldn't find their name anywhere. People have had to make up names to talk about them. I, that really feel, I feel like it rarely happens. Maybe in true crime, you <laughs> hear about that a lot, but uh, but they they were really freaked out about it and have been able to hide their identities for quite some time. So I don't even know if their names are Alan and Debbie Tallman or they just made it up. I have no idea. Oh, I I'm think serious. I think it's got to be a fake name because how can you really like hide your kids' identities if everyone knows your names are Alan and Debbie Tallman? You know, but whatever. Yeah, I mean, at least in your town they would know who the kids are. Yeah, but anyway, so the lore is that the son's name is Danny, which is been like openly just an arbitrary name okay and then they're the daughters are margaret and sarah again arbitrary names okay um so a few weeks after they move in everything's fine at first and then unexplainable things begin to happen and it Mm. all starts when alan brings home a bunk bed for the kids that he thrifted from a consignment shop it, he set it up in the basement, and around this time, all of the kids start getting sick for no reason. Oh, no. And they went from kids who never get sick to having weekly doctor visits each. Oh, no. They're just sick, sick, sick. Um, a month later, uh, they're still, I guess, dealing with colds and being sick and all that, but the family moves the bunk bed upstairs into the girls' room. Um, while the son's room is next door. So now the bunk bed is really next to both of them all the time. <laughs> They're like, I know what will fix it. Let's bring this <laughs> haunted furniture even closer. <laughs> also, though, like that, I feel like there's something already inherently dark about the fact that the thing that is haunted is like a children's bunk bed. <gasps> That's so true. Like what dark shit happened? Ooh. For- Unless it came from, like, a haunted house where everything got covered in, like, spirit goop and everything has an attachment on it. But, like, like a bunk bed that's for kids really makes me feel like something I awful I didn't happened. even think of that. That makes – yeah, like like a like a wine cabinet, like the Dybbuk box. It's like, okay, it has a storied past and some mm-hmm. old woman put a spell on it. Okay, but a bunk bed, you're right. Like, that's inherently an innocent place for kids to sleep. You wouldn't think if you walked into a room, you wouldn't look at the bunk bed and be like, that's the thing that's got to have like an attachment to it. You know, I'd be like, I want top bunk. And then you'd be like, no, I want top bunk. You know, that's a good question. Are you a top or a bottom? Well, (laughs) (laughs) it's about.
about time we have this conversation, you know? Nobody, you've never, never asked me before. We've never talked about it, but, you know, um, in, bunk, oh. in bunk bed terms. What... <laughs> Very exclusively in bunk bed terms, I like to be in the top bunk. Interesting, interesting. Okay. What about you very exclusively in t- bed, bunk bed terms? I've always, you know, been a switch, you know, but like, I, I feel like um, with, uh, I don't know, I've always been scared of rolling. So I used to have a bunk bed as a kid, which is so ironic because I was an only child. And the yeah. Bottom, the bottom <laughs> you bunk can have was... both bunks, which is so unfair. <laughs> the bottom bunk was for all my toys. Oh my um, God. <laughs> That's the most M thing I've ever heard. But I always had a fear of rolling over and like splat on the floor you yeah. know and so i think i out of nerves i'm i'm a bottom bunker yeah i feel like i always was like i always got the top bunk inherently because i was older and so i got first pick and it felt like the cooler option mm-hmm. but now i'm like i have to pee in the night and like i don't want to climb down a ladder to go pee and i certainly I, don't want to climb down a ladder and not with at, these at any time <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, for no no reason whatsoever but then the bunk bottom bunk you kind of have a nice little like cave so i feel like as yeah. an adult maybe i like the the bottom better um exclusively once again in bunk bed terms we're speaking right don't take this out of context people truly uh it goes both ways here um <laughs> but also like my favorite thing about a bottom bunk is that you could i feel like everyone it's so underrated because you could put a really big blanket or mm-hmm. sheet underneath the mattress of the top bunk and you've got a cave like you you've have got a whole a... fort yeah and so that was always my i like feeling like like and also you and can contained. kick the person above you oh <laughs> if i had someone to kick i bet that would have been so fun yeah i'm it's too bad you would go you would put your toys up there and be like i'm gonna kick them <laughs> <laughs> and then it would just rain toys and it would be like such so a non-problem oh um, wow what a life anyway <laughs> let's, a life. let's let's keep it moving so um the bunk bed they set it up uh in their room officially and on the very first night that the bunk bed is next to them the seven-year-old son he wakes up uh to his radio on at full blast <gasps> not only that But the loudest, not only is it on the loudest setting, but like a spirit box, it is rapidly going through the stations by itself. Forget it. And he can even see the dial turning itself. No! And the meter bouncing back and forth. Oh, no. Um, And so he runs to his parents, freaking out. They blame it on faulty wiring, which like, ugh, so boring of an excuse that <laughs> it also doesn't even make sense. But I guess as a parent, you just like, you have to say to, something like, before yeah. you get to the bottom of it. I guess when you're seven, faulty wiring is a good enough excuse. But like, like, you don't know, right? The house is settling. When you're older, you're like, wait a second. Why do they always say that? What does that even mean? I Nobody never knows. Un- it was always such a condescending remark to me of like, oh, well, the house is settling. Like, what Duh. the fuck does that mean? What it's is it, like, settling. Well, Let it what, be. When it grew legs and now it's sitting back down now that we're here? What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, it's just like readjusting its skirts. I don't know. Yeah, maybe spiritually there really is like a, the house is settling, but that defeats the purpose of an explanation against spirits. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. so anyway, the he the parents say it's faulty wiring, and they take the radio out of the room. Um, and around this time, they also have a cat that starts acting out of character until like like hanging by the walls and freaking out and like des- desperate to be near people, and eventually just runs away, like. Oh no! Cat's like I don't even want to be a part of this. That's sad. On top of that, Debbie's sister and mom. Every time they come over to the house, they think it feels really weird there. They're getting weird vibes. And a few more weeks later, Alan is now painting in the basement. And when he gets up to leave for a moment, he leaves the paintbrush on like the pan where you like pour the paint into. Uh huh. And when he comes back, the paintbrush is not in the pan. It is. In the paint bucket upside down with the handle in first. Ew. And now they don't have a cat, so you can't blame it on the cat. Yeah, um, that's very poltergeisty. Yeah, it was like, so the brush, the brush was. The bristles were out, like uh-huh. facing out. Ew. That, and also like, what a pain in the ass to have to clean that up. Granted, they did have a seven-year-old son. It could have been that, but I, whatever. I would still, obviously, first think it's ghost. faulty wiring, <laughs> probably. <laughs> right, that's right, what right, I would right. say. <laughs> so uh, when he went back to painting, uh, he was like, "Well, that was weird." He went back to painting, and he saw a shadow figure from the corner of his eye. Oh God! 
And later in an interview, Alan even says, I figured that something was strange, but I still wouldn't accept that my house was haunted. So he's still in denial. And eventually in the basement, another instance happens where a window has taken itself off of its track and is now laid down in the room. Ugh. As if someone tried to take the window apart so they could crawl in and break in or something, but nothing was stolen. The window was just like gently laid down. Ew. And uh, apparently the window was high enough that anyone who ever needed access to it would have needed a ladder and there was no chair or anything out. Was the bunk bed ladder still intact or did someone oh, take that guy? That would be interesting. Just a whole the whole uninstall of a bunk bed stair just for mm -hmm. this window trick. So eventually, because they it felt like someone broke in, and I think Debbie at this point wasn't even going in the basement anymore, they get a dog um, for protection, but even he is acting really weird for no reason. And a babysitter even tells Alan and Debbie one time that when she was watching their son, she saw their rocking chair rocking by itself. Um, the son also confirms it. He's like, oh, I saw that shit too. Mm -hmm. At seven, but that was a direct quote. Um, and Alan's <laughs> mother also didn't like the house uh, on top of Debbie's family. Alan's mom didn't like the house. And one time when she was babysitting, she woke up and saw red eyes staring at her through the window. And then when she like blinked and rubbed her eyes because she was like, what is that? The eyes were still there. Oh. Which I, I don't know if I hate more or less, but usually you think like in a horror movie, like, oh, if I blink, it'll go away. It'll go away. But it was still there. Or it'll come closer. Oh, shut the fuck up, Christine. That is so scary. Ah! <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> Your writer is showing. Um... <laughs> Very well written, I would say. <laughs> so many people on top of her ended up witnessing these red eyes looking back at them. Hmm. And here's where it gets the worst to me. Eventually, their two-year-old daughter, who I guess we're calling Margaret or something, she starts talking about a witch in her room. Oh, boy. She'd seen her hiding behind her door at night. Oh, my God. And apparently this witch had glowing red eyes, just okay. like the ones everyone's been seeing. And she was known to casually set fires in the room at night. Oh, okay. With her eyes or just like... I don't know. Her Does hands? she have laser beams or is she conjured? Maybe. I have no idea. Um, so... Apparently these fires were, I don't think the two-year-old said this, but if I were to sum it up as an adult, I would say that I think the baby was like being, having some sort of like hallucinations from, you know, the spirit was making them see things because the fire would never actually singe or burn anything. It just, they would see fires and then the fire would vanish. Just the kids saw the fires, right? Just the kids. Yeah. Okay. But so I don't think the kids saying like, I saw a fire that was not with that i hallucinated like i just i think um it's not like she was seeing actual fires that were causing damage right was... i got you it just that's how she explained what she saw yes okay um and so the daughter would talk about this witch all the time and after a month debbie still hadn't even told the son or really mentioned it to her husband because she didn't want to scare anybody until one night when her son approaches her and says, I've been seeing an old woman by my door at night who glows like fire. <gasps> okay, now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's your uh, your response if anyone ever approaches you with a, I'll with a say, demon. I'll say, look who's talking. <laughs> so now we're cooking. Things now are cooking. cooking with gas. <laughs> Did your stepdad teach you that? Yeah, that I don't like... know what's happening to me right <laughs> that now. That was a full-blown catchphrase right there. <laughs> it must be this hoodie. <laughs> so after uh, he's confirmed this witch, the house always starts showing signs of activity all the time. Doors are opening and closing. They're seeing lights floating around. There are orbs. They're hearing voices calling out their names at night. And the kids keep seeing this witch, mm. may or may not be, who may or may not be setting things on fire. The older daughter also begins having an imaginary friend during the day. Mm -mm. I was waiting for this. I was like, one of them's going to have an imaginary friend for sure. And she lit up a room, everybody. This <laughs> she imaginary was a pillar. friend. It's a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and soon she starts having nightmares after this imaginary friend starts showing up. And mm. now the kids are completely unable to sleep at night. They're, you know, 
terrified. Debbie also starts having nightmares and she starts th- seeing things moving around the house. Like she sees like the garage door opening by itself and closing by itself. Um, her and Alan start fighting more and Alan mm. later attributes that to the entity in the house. And Alan even starts sleeping in the kids' room so that they could sleep through the night. And really, I'd be like, maybe so I could also sleep through the night because I, I for like, sure, buddy system. Um, and eventually, the family is so fed up, they go to their pastor named Wayne Dobritz. Why are pastors always named Wayne? It's always a, a name that is that I don't hear often anymore. Right? I don't know. When I think of a priest, I think of like, josiah or isaiah or david or like bill i feel like they're always father bill oh yeah (laughs) pastor dan yeah something like that (laughs) um yeah yeah it's always either incredibly biblical or like just like your dad's white bread yeah (laughs) (laughs) like reverend gary okay um and so they go to pastor wayne you're right this time, Christine. Yes. And when he goes to check out the house, he says immediately that it feels evil, which mm. I am hesitant about because I feel like if you're a pastor, I feel like, I don't know. The What what we find out later is that he said the way to correct this would probably be, be going to church more often. It just feels <laughs> a little like, I don't know. It's so perf- weird. Everyone in town was like, wow, he called my house evil too. Yeah, exactly. It's I a little the performative. church attendance is down lately. Yeah, exactly. He's like, ooh, this house that I, you know, has is probably brand new. I just sense demons everywhere. You he must just, like, become a Christian. He just like has a lighter in his pocket because he's been lighting fires <laughs> to try and <laughs> he's been pushing the windows out. It's, it's, just, yeah, it's all a big fluke from Wayne. Like, and so anyway, he I think he's just trying to turn people closer to Jesus. And also this was mid satanic panic. So uh-huh, yes. I am hesitant about the pastor because he also pretty much didn't do anything for them. Like <laughs> he said like, well, there's really nothing I can do, but go to church more often. Yeah. So just felt like he, his heart wasn't in it. Yeah. Um, seriously. Commit a little harder guy. Yeah. And then the family had to live like this for another seven months, <sighs> even though the pastor like was great. Fully Thanks a lot, bud. So a week before Christmas, Alan has had enough. He, flips out and he yells at the spirits Uh-oh. which uh, if we've ever seen anything from bagel bites enticing them is uh or antagonizing yeah. them is not the uh the yeah thing. this is not gonna end well for you bud so he says if you want a fight fight with me oh no Ooh. so after this there's actually peace for like three weeks in the house and they have They've been bamboozled into thinking everything's I was gonna say, fine. They love to these ghosts. They love to lull you into a false sense of security. You know, I wonder if it's because a time is so different for them that they're like, "We've got eternity. Three weeks is right. Nothing. We'll let you sit with this and think you won." Oh, that's just cruel. Like, what do you think three weeks is in eternity time? Like a blank? Uh, probably a fucking millisecond. Yeah, it's one of the reasons that I. It's one of my personal issues when uh, with like investigating because I feel like if we say like do something right now, like what does right now mean to them? Like great point. Like <gasps> oh, I are, never thought of that. What if we leave and then all of a sudden they start answering all our questions? Yeah, like what if they're like, "Hang on, let me like use the bathroom or something." And it takes like 30 seconds for them to respond, but 30 to seconds for us is like 5. <laughs> well, I'm saying it takes like, what them if they're 40 you, 40 days on their side to use the bathroom is a little known fact about ghosts. <laughs> well, what if they're like their version of one second is like, yeah, like a year. And so when we see things for no reason, it's because they're responding to something from forever ago. Yeah. Even, and what if that's like the times that they even wanted to respond because like they've got nothing going on. Like what it, what does it mean to them to even respond to us if they're not interested? Yeah, and that's so deep. I mean, that's me. <laughs> I should have known. Deep like an ocean over here. Tell That's you. right. So uh, three weeks passed. Maybe for them it was like the blink of an eye. And it was one pee on, break. One pee break. And on January 7th at two in the morning, Alan is coming home from a shift at work. <laughs> and while pulling into the driveway and getting out of his car, he hears voices that he knew by now as the spirits of the house because he had heard from them whenever they call his name at night okay so he already knows what they sound like Uh oh yeah which is on its own just like just disgusting that's why you know it's too far yeah they start calling his name and the weird thing is it's outside now 
It's always been in the house, but now outside he's hearing his name, and it's 2 a.m. He's by himself. Uh oh. The voices get louder and louder until eventually it feels like they've like combined with the wind, and it's like a howling calling out his name. And then he hears, "Come here!" Ooh. And he freaks out. Start running. He starts running around the house looking for whoever is making this voice. He thinks maybe someone's throwing their voice or playing a trick on him running around the house and then all of a sudden the voice and the howling stop okay and he just stands there still and eventually he makes his way to the front door and when he hears the voice again he hears come here <gasps> he looks around again until he moves his gaze to the garage and it's engulfed in flames <gasps> he runs inside to find a fire extinguisher put his stuff down and comes sprinting back out and the garage is totally fine. Oh, my God. Now they're just gaslighting him, literally. Literally. <laughs> With literal gasoline. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and now he, I guess he's also seeing the fires like his kids have been seeing. But now oh, it's on his no. home. Uh, he goes back inside after being, like, probably really jarred by all that. He goes back inside and he tries to clean up the stuff that he dropped in the middle of his frenzy and he goes down to grab his lunchbox and when he grabs it he feels an invisible hand violently smack it away from him and the lunchbox goes across the room hey not knowing what to do alan just heads upstairs and tries to get some sleep in his daughter's room Aww. um but as be like he's... get out dad i know They're clearly following you yeah it's like you said you wanted a fight so you're on your own right yeah now. leave me out of it well, so he's laying on the floor trying to like just breathe through whatever happened and all of a sudden a strange fog rolls in from the hall and the fog looks like smoke. <gasps> oh no. And Alan watches the smoke fill the room and soon he hears the voice again and the voice says, "You're dead." Oh. Jesus. Alan s starts feeling like he can't breathe, he's freaking out. He runs over to his wife and just by how scared he looks, she calls the pastor again and goes, hey, it's been a full seven months. Um, <laughs> just to update you, we're freaking hey, out Hey, Wayne, here. how are you? <laughs> hey, How's girl. How's the kids? How's the wife? WD, what's cracking? And so <laughs> Alan, after this, I'm, I'm, I guess he said go to church and that was all he had to offer because we don't hear from him again. And... Alan just tries to go back to sleep, but that becomes a constant now that he starts having nightmares of coming home and finding his family violently murdered or dead <gasps> on the floor. Oh, no. That's And bad. he's starting to believe that this entity would actually hurt them, which, like, how did you... I would have already pieced that together, I think. <laughs> but okay, I'm glad he's caught up. And he's scared to leave his family alone in the house, fair enough. So he starts asking relatives to stay with them while he's working at night because he just feels so guilty that he's not there. Oh, jeez. Um, he starts asking his relatives who happen to be skeptical of ghosts so that way, like, they wouldn't say no to, okay, <laughs> to coming to the that's house. that's nice. I guess they're Good useful plan. for something. Good plan. And one night before Alan got home, the relative, I heard from one source, it was a nephew. I don't know how true that is, but um, the relative was in the bedroom with the kids when even they saw the fog roll in and they saw the witch appear. <gasps> this relative runs out of the room screaming. Debbie finds him and basically says, you know what? If even you're seeing this, fuck it. I don't want to be here anymore and starts packing her bags that night. I don't blame her. And the family never went back to the house. Oh my gosh, that's it. So putting the timeline together, they assume that it was the bunk bed that had an attachment because that was really the beginning of all this. But they don't know for sure. But they're, they've are they really... What if it's not and the bunk bed's like, what? I just showed up <laughs> the wrong day, wrong place, wrong time. It's like I was already like in a secondary, like a secondhand store. Like Seriously. I thought this was going to be my next big break and... Well, it's like Paddington Bear. He was just finally getting a home. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, they're they're pretty convinced it was the bunk bed, just adding up the story. And To be clear, so am I. Just saying. Yeah. Perfect. So because they were so convinced that it was the bunk bed, they um, got it out of the house and they brought it to a private junkyard and then personally watched it be demolished and buried <laughs> on site. Like, they were like buried okay wow <laughs> they were like we don't want to we want to know that this is never coming back to our house oh and, my god 
and then a month later the house was up for sale and usually it doesn't move that fast but i guess there's some exceptions and whoever they were working with saw that they were desperate to get out of this house and so they ended up getting it out getting out within a month and oh my god because of the quickness of their move uh, rumors started spreading very quickly around the community about how haunted this place was. Um, the neighbors were calling it Wisconsin's Amityville. They were saying that the walls were bleeding. They said there was a portal to, portal to hell in there. And then a different, another, um, another source had a different thing where it said the Wisconsin's Amityville, the walls blood, portal to hell. But on top of all that, another rumor that the source says is that people started spreading the rumors that the family had a ghost powered snowblower that would clean the driveway by itself. <laughs> what the fuck? That's which, like, what? which is so, I don't know. That just goes to show you how wild a game of telephone can be. We're like, I mean, yeah, it's like, it's gotten that far where we're like talking about like equipment, like garage tools being haunted and like doing housework for you. It's like ghost- some Beauty and the Beast shit. <laughs> They're just like coming alive and singing. It really is. But also like a ghost powered snowblower that cleans the driveway for you. That sounds like a snowblower I want. So like that yeah, wouldn't be the say, thing I ran wonderful. away from. I wouldn't I feel like leave they're kind of getting house. off topic with that one. Yeah, exactly. I'm like the portal to hell. I can understand why someone would flee in the middle of the night. But like having yard work done for you, that's I'm staying. Yeah, you know? I wish. So because it was becoming the local haunted house, local hooligans began exploring the house. Um, and Not they the were hooligans. I know they were causing all sorts of um, tomfoolery. They were rabble rousing. <sighs> no, <know> goes. <laughs> you don't say <laughs> they um, I they thought it were... couldn't get worse. <laughs> Not the rabble rousers. <laughs> So they were trespassing all the time. They were climbing over fences and showing up drunk. And the police had to get involved for disorderly conduct. They were, they were snow even... blowing the driveway. Oh, <laughs> that's where that rumor came from. Christine, I got to be honest. You really are on another level today. With your oh, well, humor. I think I'm just melting my brain in this giant hoodie. But thank you so much. <laughs> You're um, you really started like with a low energy. And all of a sudden, I feel like I'm. <laughs> at flappers watching you headline like you're just flappers. <laughs> this is what i would wear also to flappers <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh these rabble rousers they were also threatening arson on the house because they were like if it's that haunted we want to burn it to the ground so then the police were like oh shit like, oh. like this is really bad and people are hearing rumors and then freaking out not actually knowing the whole story so they're actually weirdly desperate for the Talmans to like make a statement about the house but the Talmans are just so scared of this house that they're actively avoiding media oh, okay. they don't they don't want it to look like they're doing this for press they don't want it to look like they're and doing they were this. trying to like protect their kids uh, like identities right yeah so. so they're avoiding the press and the cops are like please put out a statement because people are you know mob mentality it's getting really bad by you not saying anything it's like weirdly adding fuel to this yeah so um the police asked them to do an interview and hopefully their answers will calm things down so the gossip isn't so bad and along with the interview the press even agree that they're going to hide the kids names and then they will i don't know how this works i this feels backwards to me but i guess this is a good thing that the cops were willing to release the address of the house because well they already weren't living there so it's not like anyone was going to be in danger mm. but also for so many people who are threatening arson it was like at least if you're going to do it like don't accidentally burn down a, an actual family's home where like people are going to be oh in the like the like the wrong house yeah yeah I got so you. Yeah. they had to release the address so if something bad happened at least it'd be at the right place um <laughs> if you're gonna burn it down here's the address okay. or if you're gonna like <laughs> if you're going to be one of those people who's breaking in and exploring at least you're not literally breaking into somebody's house and like fair point fair point um so anyway they make all these like terms and they agree that they're going to put out one real statement and it's with the united press who publishes an article called haunted house to be sold bunk beds buried in landfill (laughs) and in in the article debbie says that they had the beds buried because uh 
they didn't want the house sitting on top of its ashes. There's like, I guess they were like, we were going to burn it anyway, but like if we burnt it here, then it might still be connected to the property. Yeah, so let's put it somewhere else. Okay, that's fair. So as for the skeptics to this story, the main explanations people come up with for why this wasn't a ghost and what was really going on a lot of people say that the family was hallucinating from a gas leak because uh around this time a local power company had replaced faulty gas connections in houses nearby Uh oh and so but it wasn't on their house so it wasn't like a direct hit to a gas leak or anything that they would have been breathing in but a lot of people say like oh they must have had they must have just been really sensitive as a family to a gas leak nearby and they were hallucinating another thing that skeptics say is that it was black mold that the kids were breathing in in the house and they that's why they were getting sick before the hauntings began that was my first gut instinct when you first said they all moved in and the kids started getting sick i was like i've been there that sounds like mold christina's actually had to deal with a a black mold like many times throughout my life in a a weird weirdly but uh you've been hospitalized for black mold i was yeah it's really dangerous and so are gas leaks i mean there's an episode of um kindred spirits you know how much i love that show um with my with my boy chip coffee and uh there was an episode and i'm not going to spoil which one so don't worry but there was an episode where it actually was a gas leak oh like they they went to investigate and it turns out I think it was that show. Maybe it was a different ghost show. But anyway, I remember watching it and going, there's something, there's a gas leak in this house. And I was like, they're going to pretend it's a ghost and all this. And by the end, like, they literally found out it was carbon monoxide. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Just heads wow. up, folks. Just get get yourself a carbon monoxide protector or detector. Um, oh, please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I know a lot of, in Virginia, it is one of the states where it is not mandated that you have to have really? a carbon monoxide. I think in California, it's like is in California in certain states it's already like immediately comes in a built house but in other places right. you have to go buy your own detector so right it's check worth doing. Uh, check where you live and make sure you have one with you yeah um so the other skeptics say black mold since the kids were getting sick but the kids symptoms other than getting sick when they first moved in yeah didn't match mold toxicity and black mold isn't said to lead to hallucinations Um, right i was gonna say it only explains part of it yeah it only explains the kids getting sick at first yeah um and then fun fact miss uh unsolved mysteries did an episode on the tallmans who also at during this round of interviews they asked to be portrayed by actors and to hide their kids identities and the episode was actually filmed in the house oh so Cool. But I guess it's because they didn't live there anymore. So they were like, all right, yeah, you can film it. And it hadn't been burned down yet by some hooligans. Yeah. Well, so I guess the owners of the house at the time they filmed gave them permission and also said that they they never had any issues with the house. So some people could say, oh, well, I guess the house isn't haunted. But other people could say, well, I guess the bunk bed being burned uh-huh. away. It's a, it's a confirmation that the bunk beds were the, the culprit all along. Or it was the family that was haunted or, yeah. Yeah. So... Debbie has been quoted saying, I think it's going to be a long time before things get back to normal. I still can't sit at home and not be afraid of the dark. No, that's sad. And when asked if they thought the entity could follow them elsewhere, Debbie said, I never thought this could happen the first time. So I don't know if this is the end of the story. Oh, that's got to be that, scary. That is the Tallman house. That was a great story. Em. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. It's like a classic campfire story. I love it. I I feel like there were some spooky lefts and rights, you know, ups and, and downs. And ups and downs. I mean, the haunted bunk bed, like, I don't know. I mean, I'm all for buying second hand, but, like, I didn't know you could buy a second or a haunted bunk bed. Uh, yeah, it just, I think, reminds you that any item could have an attachment. Because <sighs> it really, I would really think it has to be a tchotchka or, like, a, like, or a yeah. book or something like something small that like was important uh-huh. in a certain way and like maybe was on a shelf and like witnessed something but like just a fucking bed i don't just, know like, you seem pretty opposed to my estate sale couch i bought i still i stand by that um <laughs> <laughs> also did aren't your stairs from an estate sale or something no like, that's... my stairs are from a church that got torn down in the early 1900s so 
I never know if when something has a connection to a church, if that makes it better or worse. Doesn't it Somet- feel like it's more haunted, even though theoretically you're like, well, I guess if it was in a sacred space. Yeah, it's um, I feel like it should technically be safe, right. safer. But I also feel like. I don't know. I something feel like something is creepier about it being some, from a church. Yeah, something makes it really dark, and I don't, I don't know what. I don't know. Maybe it's Christianity. Who's to say? <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna... how organized was this church that these stairs came from? <laughs> I'm gonna call Wayne and ask what he thinks. Um, yeah, <laughs> he's probably gonna be like, go to church. Um, he's gonna be like, you're a dirty sinner. Is the real yeah, answer? To all I this. mean, he's not wrong. Uh, okay, um, I have a story for you today. This is the story of the. Unfortunately, the murder of Katie Poyer. Okay. I got to get my gargs out. Get to go, get the gargs. Got my gargs. All right. I'm ready to uh, draw out myself, draw myself a little map with these guys. Okay. Excellent. Keep up with you. Okay. Katie Point Poyer? Poyer. Poyer. Okay. So it's spelled P O I R I E R. And I've heard a few things, but the Forensic Files episode called them the Poyers, and they were interviewed in that episode. So I like to think that's how yeah. you say their name. Um, but I've heard Poirier. I don't Poirier. know. You've, you've been interviewed as Christine Schaefer quite that's a That's very true. I've been interviewed by a lot, a lot of things. So, yeah, that's a good <laughs> point. That's a good point. Uh, but I'm going to go with Poyer now and just hope that's correct. Okay. So uh, Katie was born February 28th, 1980 in Duluth, Minnesota. And she was born to parents Pam and Steve Poyer. She also had an older brother named Patrick. And Mm. Katie was the baby of the family. So everybody in her family adored her. Uh, She was a friend to everyone. Hate to say it. Lit up a room. Uh, Mm. She, I know, just already a bad start. She had an adventurous edge. She loved sports, like water skiing, very active. Um, This detail I'm about to say always like gets me a li- this kind of a detail always gets me a little choked up because it's so specific her mom remembers that she was obsessed with french fries dipped in ranch Ugh. and like just it's just hearing that it's just so specific that it like breaks your heart it's like what have you know it's just a a deeper twist of a knife yeah it just feels like such a quaint memory to have um her mom said she was just a peanut, but she eats like a horse. So she, <laughs> she loved her French fries and ranch. Uh, she had placed first runner up in a local pageant in town, and uh, she dedicated her time to family, friends, and she had two dogs named Goldie and Riley that she loved. She hmm. graduated Barnum High School on the honor roll, and she went on to study law enforcement at Fond du Lac Community College. So around this time, she fell in love with a local boy named Mark Johnson, and they got engaged, and they decided once Katie graduated, uh, they were going to move to Montana. So on May 26, 1999, Katie was working at her gas station job in Moose Lake, Minnesota, and it was Memorial Day weekend, so things were pretty busy, um, and this being like a small town gas station, it wasn't usually busy, but... uh, you know, it's a holiday weekend. People are stopping in for beer, cigarettes, what have you. So Katie worked the late shift. So she was often the only employee in the gas station well after midnight, uh, dealing with whatever customers came in on her own. The gas station itself was located just off the freeway that passed by town. So on such a busy holiday weekend, there was a constant stream of travelers passing through for gas, snacks, bathroom breaks. It was a little after midnight when police received a strange report. Someone called in from the gas station and said, hey, I'm here. The lights are on and the store is open and there are customers here, but there is no attendant. There's no employee to be found. Oh, crap. Okay. Yeah. So the caller had looked around the entire gas station, found no sign of any employee being there, uh, and were obviously worried something was wrong. And this... (laughs) This good citizen, this concerned citizen called police and said, you know, I don't want somebody to just start looting the store because nobody's here to keep an eye on it. Right. Well, maybe I mean, I could see myself not jumping to a true crime conclusion and just thinking like, oh, this person said like, fuck working here and just it's, like kind of bounced. Yeah, it's a holiday know? weekend. Maybe he wanted to get off early. <laughs> yeah. 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 It could be any. I, I my first thought might not be this guy was kidnapped or, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah. So, you know, it's so funny, and I was going to actually ask you 
about this, like where you would stand, because uh, people, it's like small town, people were being uh, so conscientious and like, talk about concerned citizens. When police arrived, there were uh, notes <laughs> on the counter where people wrote what they had purchased and had left cash on the counter. <laughs> To be like, well, this is for my Snickers bar. <laughs> well, that's precious. Um, I know. What what small town is this again? Uh, Moose Lake, Minnesota. Well, also the Midwest. I mean, yeah, also on. the Midwest. Okay, you you nailed it. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> that's okay. A- my question was going to be like, would what would you do if people were like, well, there's nobody here. Um, I'm too afraid of security cameras, but if I knew I wasn't being watched, I would absolutely steal it. You'd just take it. <laughs> yeah. I think I would I'm leave a bill, moral. but also part of me would think, well, someone else is just going to take my money off the counter. <laughs> oh, yeah. I wouldn't even, I think I would, um, it depends if it were like a candy bar. Again, assuming that like the security cameras just don't yeah. exist. If it were a candy bar, I'm just going to take it. If it were like more than like if it were like 10 bucks or more i would feel too guilty and i would maybe leave a tenner or something you know? yeah i think i'd leave a bill especially if there were other people there because i'm like mm-hmm. i don't want to be oh, the only yeah. asshole who's not paying for my stuff i uh we have a place still in my hometown where they have a tab list where like you can walk in and order whatever you want <gasps> and like put if it on you my tab if you don't have money at the time, you just say, oh, put it on my tab. And then they just put your name on the whiteboard. And then they have a tally mark system of like how many times you've come in since you've owed money. And if you come in like f- five times and still haven't paid your debt, then you're blacklisted from the restaurant. OK, I mean, that's fair, right? Five yeah. times. Like, come on. <laughs> Especially because it's like it's a hot dog place. Like it's like three bucks. Like, <laughs> yeah, like if you're going to come in for five hot dogs, you should at least pay for one of them. OK, yeah, exactly. Oh, boy. So someone uh, had called the police. The police show up. There's, like, all these notes with people being like, I bought my Marlboros. Here's 10 bucks, whatever. Um, And weirdly enough, the police chief had actually been at the gas station only an hour earlier, like, as a customer. So he's like, that's odd, because Katie was here before working an hour ago. That works so, really well for him though, because he can like write his own notes can down of like pinpoint she, where she was. Yeah, like yeah. an hour ago she was there. I saw her with my own eyes. Exactly. So he knew she had been there. So he's like, "Well, this is really strange. She shouldn't just be vanishing, you know, during her shift." So customers told the officer that they had searched and waited for twenty minutes, thinking at first maybe she was in the bathroom, and then they were worried maybe she was hurt or had a health emergency. But they just, you know. There was no trace of her, so most of them left, and then that one guy called police. So the police chief was already on red alert. He he actually knew Katie. I mean, again, this is a small town, so he knew her, and she's studying law enforcement at the local college. So to him, he's like, this is odd and is not in her character. Um, it, there's no, no way she would just leave the place like open and abandoned like this. So pretty immediately they start looking for clues and they saw the last purchase logged in the register was at 1120 p.m. And that was about an hour before this call came in. Mm -hmm. There was no sign of a struggle in the store. Everything was exactly where it should be. So investigators, you called it already, turned to the four surveillance cameras in the store. Mm. And this is when they contacted the manager to access the footage. And now we have to remember this is 1999. So the cameras, I mean, it's surprising that there are even cameras at all in a small town convenience store. But uh, even so, they're going to be grainy and not Mm -hmm. super clear. So uh, it was difficult to make out any details, but they could see that Katie was indeed alone behind the counter serving customers as they came and went. Also, sometimes I think about this, like if I were in a position of watching of knowing something had happened to someone and watching back the footage like that. Yeah. Like how your heart would be pounding, like waiting for something to happen on the screen. Cause you know, it's coming. Yeah. yeah like something bad must happen. I mean, so I mean, it's like chilling. a real, a real horror movie. You know, yeah. something's going to come. Yeah. Come. Like ju- a jump scare, but for real. So it was at 1130 PM that a man came in and he started walking around the shelves several times Ugh. in circles before approaching Katie. They had a conversation and then he left the store and moments later he walked back inside. Police watched in horror as his grainy figure grabbed Katie and forced her out of the door into the parking lot and out of view of the cameras. 
Mm. She had basically been kidnapped in plain view in the short break between other customers. So the cameras showed that only minutes after this man had dragged her out of the gas station, more customers arrived. So the oh, timing God. was just so terrible. Um, immediately, police contacted the FBI and the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and the entire state mobilized because the window to find and rescue Katie was dismally short. Um, apparently, according to an officer on the case, in seemingly spontaneous opportunistic abductions like this one abductors are not known to keep their victims alive for very long mm. because either they panic or they're like whoa this they don't have like a long drawn out process like plan for for this victim it's sort of like right. they, they got through step one and forgot step two and... yes yes it's like spur of the moment and now what and of course usually that now what turns into like the worst possible case scenario mm-hmm so the rescue effort needed as many people as possible to search the area and find Katie before it was too late. Police were watching this footage over and over, trying to get any information they could. Um, they were trying to get a picture of her abductor's face so they could identify him. They could tell he was white and wearing dark pants and a dark T-shirt, but there was like no other identifying details they could make out. They couldn't even determine his age from this video. So, like I said, it's, it was 1999. Um, video software wasn't really, like, <laughs> super cutting edge. And if it was, it wasn't, you know, in local small town police stations. So police took the footage to a place where they did have video software, and that was a nearby casino. <laughs> oh, God. Because okay. you can imagine a casino, they want to have... They know all about security They want to watch everybody's face very closely. <laughs> so... They use their advanced surveillance technology to enhance the video, which is like my favorite terminology when people in a movie or like a cliche, like hacker thing, they're like, enhance, oh, enhance. You know, you know my favorite. I'm in the main frame. I'm in the main frame. I'm exactly. The main, when I uh, when I used to work at my last job, my boss would often get locked out of her computer. And every time she figured it back out, she'd go, oh, I'm in the main frame. I'm okay. in the main. <laughs> Don't worry, everybody. <laughs> We can stop panicking. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, quote unquote, enhancing the video, whatever that means. They're in the main frame. <laughs> they're in the main frame. Actually, they're not because they were oh. not able to enhance it enough to get in the main frame and shed light on the abductor's identity. Ugh. Okay. But so they, it was kind of a bust. It was, well, sort of, because even though they weren't able to identify more details about him, they could see uh, that the man had wrapped some sort of cord around Katie's neck, which is how he took control and forced her out of the store. So they've just added another horrific detail to what they know about this abduction. I just can't imagine being like her, her parents. Like, I, know. I mean, like, to know, I mean, it's like, do you want more details or do you not want more details? I know like, it's I, almost like this is helpful in the case, but it just makes everything so much worse for the family. Then you just everything you just played in your head as a worst case scenario now has a a worse detail to it. And yeah, to and, and it's not again. just like your imagination. Like you know that actually happened, which Ugh, is just oh makes God. it so much worse. And speaking of Katie's family, at this point, police reach out and tell her, tell them what's going on. Um, Patrick, Katie's 21 year old brother, woke up in his basement bedroom to his mom screaming, "Someone <sighs> has her!" Oh my God. And obviously, at first, he's totally shaken. He doesn't know what this means. He asked what she was saying, and his dad came in and explained to him that Katie had been kidnapped. And the way he described it was that he felt completely numb, and for him, everything went quiet. Uh. Meanwhile, his mother, Pam, was inconsolable. She was screaming and crying, trying to make sense of the tragedy unfolding while they were just helpless at home. And Patrick, uh, the brother, decided he was go going to go help out the search efforts. So, I mean, I can understand that for sure. He said, I needed to find my sister. I'm going to bring her home. So mm. I can definitely understand that inclination to, like, just go do something when you feel, yeah. like, helpless, like you know. busy hands or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And to feel like maybe you'll get closer to an answer. So the family watched the surveillance footage sure they would recognize the abductor in such a small community but when they saw it they were surprised to realize like no they had no idea who this could be well i always i i feel like whenever it's a small town thing like 
you would have to be so bold as a member of that small community to, to, to think to you could know get away your with rec- it. Yeah, exactly. To like know, you have, I would yeah. almost assume that in a small town crime, it's going to be an outsider just kind of like rolling through the city. Yeah, which this, is, you hope it's a small town person so you could recognize them. But you'd at just, least I, know who they are. Yeah, I don't know if you're ever lucky enough for that to be the case, though. So as night turned into day, Katie's family made media appearances pleading with Katie's kidnapper to let Katie come home. Statewide searches scoured the rural countryside all the way to the cities, farms, roadside ditches, basically anywhere where they might have found Katie abandoned. Many friends and family and some neighbors were staying over at the Poyer's home, and there were so many of them that Patrick remembers sleeping on the kitchen floor some nights because the house was just chock-a-block full of people trying to help with the search. Police kept reaching out to the community for any clues about who the abductor might be. And meanwhile, next to next door to the gas station, there was a subway sandwich shop and a young woman named Kathy had been closing up for the night when a suspicious man came in who was clearly drunk. She told him she was closing and he left. So Kathy poked her head into the gas station to let Katie know she was leaving. But as she walked away, the drunk man from before stopped her on the sidewalk. He asked her, are you done for the evening? She was seriously weirded out and she made a quick getaway. Kathy told police the man she encountered was in his mid 40s with graying hair. But when she looked at the surveillance footage, it was so grainy that she couldn't tell if it was the man she'd encountered. Um, But this had taken place on the night of Katie's abduction. So this was like a humongous clue. Oof. Okay. She didn't know what he looked like or she knew what he looked like, but she couldn't identify him from the video footage. But she could give a detailed description of the man's truck. Mm. So not only did she remember it was a black Ford F-150 extended cab with custom paint on the side, she had even somehow remembered four out of the six digits on the license plate. Oh, shit. Okay, go Kathy. I know. Like, nailing wow. it. Nailing it. She said it coincidentally had the same first three numbers as the local area code. So she oh. rec- she could remember that. And then she remembered it ended with a Y. And she, like, took note of that because she said this guy was being so weird. So this is another, like... Good for see, her. S- yeah, see something, say something. She said he drove away and she wrote down what she could remember of the license plate. And, like, probably thinking, oh, I'm probably overreacting. And then a few days later, you're like, oh, shit. Yeah. This might actually be useful. And it really was. So investigators were stunned that she had brought all this information to them but uh you know like i said kathy had been on high alert because this guy was acting super weird and putting her on edge so she was just watching him really closely the unfortunate thing was when once they looked through all of the license plates they found that hundreds of trucks in the state matched the first few digits of the license plate so it would be a while for them to comb through all of the potential suspects yeah yeah okay So police released a composite sketch of what they could kind of make out uh, from the footage and from what Kathy described, along with details about the truck. And tips came pouring in, but there was one in particular that seemed to stick out. Mm. So there was a man whose appearance seemed to match the composite. He was also a convicted sex offender. And in questioning, he insisted that he wasn't involved, but he did not have a provable alibi. So when they searched his home, police found rope and cord in the garbage, which they thought maybe was what he had used to, uh, you know, wrap around Katie's neck to leave her out of the gas station. Mm -hmm. So FBI agents escorted the suspect to the crime scene where they posed him in the same positions as the crime, like from what they had on the camera, Uh which I think is pretty smart because you can't necessarily make out the face. But if you can, like, pose to match up the body type. Honestly, uh, I'm so honestly just shocked and grateful that they're trying anything. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. like if it means posing him like Gumby to like <laughs> do whatever you need to do, then do it. Like, absolutely. I would be so grateful that, you know, they were working with me. They're at least me. doing like kind of thinking outside of the box. Yeah. 
But guess what? So in the footage where they brought the suspect to the crime scene and filmed him in these different positions, they could see the man's big spider web tattoo on his arm. But when they went back to the original footage, the suspect did not have any tattoo there. Oh, shit. Oh, man. So, okay. Yeah. They were like, well, that's not our guy. But I'm glad oh, really? they at least had something to base it off of, you know. Yeah, yeah. Man, I really so they thought it was going to be a clean cut. I know. Clean. It feels like it was going to be very easy, but but alas. So they ruled him out as a suspect. And next, police shifted their focus to a man named Donald Blom, who lived in Richfield, which was two hours away from the store where Katie worked. And even though he lived two hours away, he did own a hunting lodge near the gas station. Okay. He was also next on their list as an owner of one of the many trucks that matched Kathy's description. So it was a simple formality. They went to his house. Uh, They had a long list, so they were just checking off everybody on the list. A local officer went to Donald's house where they met and spoke to his wife. She told the officer that they no longer owned that truck and that when they had owned it, it was white. So the officers were like, well, damn it. And they crossed the Bloms off their list. (laughs) Well, shit. Well, up next, next family. So Patrick said, this is uh, the brother. Patrick said he didn't lose hope um, and it wasn't in the family's blood to give up. But after they ruled out the Bloms, there were really no leads left. And at this point, Katie had been missing for a week. So it's sort of like hope that they would find her alive is still is, is dwindling at this point. Yeah. Investigators turned once again to the footage, and it was, like, so maddening to watch the abductor steal Katie again and again without just being able to clear the footage and enhance it enough so that they could see. And also, I imagine this was the 90s, right? So, Mm -hmm. like, I imagine, just think of how pixelated that footage was. They just could not clear it up enough to see who it was. So (laughs) they were like, screw the casino. We're going to reach out to NASA. Uh, yeah. yeah wow i really this police force is on it they're, they're not fucking around they're like if we can't figure it out we're calling the scientists in get the astronauts over here <laughs> the <Stat>. astronauts <laughs> so they literally contact nasa who were developing technology to enhance images taken in space at long distances and it was so fascinating in the forensic files episode because they talked about how they did it um the the guy who who was working on this new technology basically i guess he was saying a video foot or a video a shot from a video is made up of two different layer i don't know forget it why am i trying to explain it basically he said <laughs> he was <laughs> able to layer the footage on top of it on top of each other and that okay. would clear the lines oh. in the footage i don't know it made sense when i watched it on forensic files I, i'm not teaching it well but Just know that it was very fascinating. All I have to know is the astronauts knew what they were doing. Thank God. (laughs) Thank God. If someone's going to know what they're doing, I would hope it's an astronaut. Um, Can you imagine an astronaut not knowing what they're (gasps) doing? That's the worst book of Amelia Bedelia I've ever heard. (laughs) Let's go to space with the astronaut that doesn't know how to fly us home. (laughs) They told me to draw the curtains. So (laughs) I drew drew some curtains on the rocket ship. Um, so more specifically, their their new technology was invented to focus blurry photos of the sun taken by satellite. And the goal was to de-blur the images as best as possible. Um, but when the NASA scientist saw the video, he said his heart sank because the video was so blurry that he was like, this is going to be a doozy oh. to try and f- solve. Shit. Okay. But he was very determined. And like I said, he started layering images on top of each other to create a more focused image instead of kind of the blurry effect. And the only thing he could finally reconstruct was that the suspect has blonde hair and he was wearing a New York Yankees baseball jersey with the number 23 on the back. Oh, that feels like a lot of information. A big lead. Yeah. They couldn't get a clear photo of his face, but at least they knew, you know, his hair color and what he was wearing. So it was their only lead, um, and they couldn't wring any more details out of the blurry footage. So police went a really, I mean, I know they've already done several random routes, taken several random routes, but they take another random route. Oh, okay. And hey, it seems to be working. They're getting somewhere. They so. are going places, you know, at the very least. So they enlist Minnesota Twins baseball player Paul Molitor to garner media attention. And Is he, he number was, 23? 
Oh no! But that would have oh. been no, no, no. Oh shit! I really sorry. I absolutely interrupted you and jumped in. But for a second, I was like, they reached out to number twenty three and <laughs> had him put out a statement. Crazy. No, but that is a very interesting thought. The the um the the jersey that he was wearing was a Yankees jersey. Yankees. So, yeah. But they had this Minnesota Twins player um, make a statement on the news. And he was actually from St. Paul. And so he uh, described – he made, basically made a PSA, a public service announcement, describing the suspect and his Yankees jersey, which apparently was pretty rare, this jersey. Hmm. And that night of his PSA, a huge tip came in. Oh, that shit. would basically crack the case. So this, interestingly enough, was the 1,960th lead. Oh, my God. Just to give some perspective of, like, how many, you know, are coming in. But honestly, if something were to happen to somebody I love, I'd be so grateful there were almost 2,000 That after 1,000, they're still taking, yeah, yeah. Oh, my agreed. God. So the call that came in was from a man who worked at a veteran's home, and he called in to report his coworker, a guy named Donald Hutchinson, who matched the composite sketch, had recently stopped driving his black truck and didn't come to work on the day of Katie's abduction. He mm. even recognized the Yankees jersey with 23 on it, mentioned in the suspect's description, and said his coworker wore that jersey occasionally. Mm. In addition to having stopped driving his black truck in the days following Katie's disappearance, he had also shown some uh, other odd behavior. He had cut and dyed his hair to drastically change his uh I wrote his opinion. Uh, <laughs> that's not what I meant. His appearance. And he had since quit his job with no notice. So they're like, okay, this is very shady behavior. Let's mm -hmm. look into it. This guy, Donald Hutchinson, had been also convicted of sexual assault and even kidnapping and had served prison time for his crimes. So now they're looking like, or they're thinking this is the pretty guy. good, good suspect. Yeah. He had changed his legal name several times, and they found out that he had recently changed his alias once again to Donald Blom, the guy <gasps> they ruled out earlier. Interesting. 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 I was going to say earlier, I was like, interesting that there was another Donald. Yep. You caught it. I saw you make a face. You caught it. You did. I was so, like, Blom? Who would pick that last name? If you're going to change your name, why not change the name Donald? Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Donald's wife had lied. Donald Blum still owned the black pickup truck with the custom paint and the license plate that matched Kathy's statement. Mm. In fact, that exact truck was in the Blum's garage back in Richfield. And at this point, they knew Donald had to be their suspect, but they could not find him. Uh, they, when they, you know, asked around, they found out he was on, quote, vacation. 200 miles away with his wife and children interesting so his wife seems to know that something's like yeah, I mean, his wife is covering for him she's right? lying right on his behalf yeah, okay, okay for whatever reason so police track him down and donald insisted he had sold his truck several months ago but what he didn't know is that police had already taken it in <laughs> like from oh my god like they found it took it in and there he's like no i don't have that truck anymore and they're like yeah i mean you're right we do right yeah so, so they god. took it but Donald did himself in with the following response. He said to police, I'm not the guy. I wasn't involved in Katie's abduction. The problem they was had, they hadn't they said the name Katie. They hadn't told him it was Katie's abduction that they were. And to be fair, you know, it was on the news and stuff. So, like, it's possible he just assumed. But it's mm -hmm. it's a pretty bold statement to make when you're not even sure why they're asking about your truck. Like, it's exactly. just... It's just a little too on the nose. Yeah. So even though he probably could have, like, lied and said, oh, well, I just saw it on the news and I assumed, he realized that he had slipped up and he basically... Caught him. <laughs> yeah, he basically, like, realized he incriminated himself and, like, almost immediately gave in. So he stood in a suspect lineup where Kathy, the woman from the subway, immediately identified him as the man, the creep, who she'd encountered the night of Katie's abduction... So police searched Donald's trailer, his hunting lodge uh, near the crime scene, certain that Katie would be inside, but there was no sign of her or her body. The trailer, however, was on 20 acres of land, so they had a lot of ground to cover. 
And while they were covering this ground, they find an enormous fire pit. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah. And this fire pit is full of soot from a recent bonfire. Oh so my God. they scour the pit where they start finding bone fragments. Oh, my God. And even deeper in the embers, they find a human tooth. <gasps> so unfortunately, the fire had charred all the DNA off the bones, which I did not know was a thing. I didn't think that was a thing either. I thought you could just extract it if you had anything. Me too, but I guess not. Um, which meant the FBI couldn't match it to Katie's DNA to affirm her identity. But... There was a molar that they found in the fire with a filler in it, like a filling. Okay. And this is so wild. Okay. So it was this very specialized filling material containing a high level of zirconium that hadn't yet hit the mass market. But a local oh. dentist said she'd only used it for one filler so far, and it was on Katie Poyer. Shut up. I wow. know. And wow. now it makes sense why this was on forensic files. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this dentist is like, oh, I got this filling material from like a convention and it was like brand new on the market, basically not widely used. And she had used it only once on Katie. So now they're thinking, well, that's that's a great match. Yeah, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. So they confront Donald with this evidence and he immediately crumbles, confesses to the crime. And when they ask him, you know, how it happened, he tells investigators that he abducted Katie, drove her to his property and strangled her to death. But what's maddening to the police and, of course, the family is that he refuses to give a motive. He just says he did it and says, I don't know why. And. Just felt like, like not just even felt drugs, like it, not... not, not, he didn't say he had raped her. He didn't say, he just said he took her and then killed her. And so they can't get any more answers than that. That's like, I, there's, I mean, we say it a million times. There's no like good way for these stories to end, but it's, there's just something additionally evil about like, well, I wanted to, so I did. Like it's Re very like refusing any closure, any sort of. Yeah. Like Israel keys of like, yes. well, you were, oh. you were nearby. You were just there. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. There's something I think so because creepy. Of, I think because of stories like this, I think a lot of gas stations now do like buddy system where like there hey. has to always be a second person. And you the, are exactly right. That actually, oh. yep. That ends up being one of the results of this case. Yep. Oh shit. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. So he tried to later recant his, his confession claiming he was uh, under the influence of prescription medication, which made him confess erroneously, which I don't know what prescription medication that is, but uh, yeah, right. careful, I guess, with that. Uh, <laughs> but the district attorney went forward with the trial anyway. And when the Poyer family got the news, uh, Katie's brother, Patrick, felt numb. Um, and this just breaks my heart. All along, he had been convinced he truly believed they would find her alive. Like, he had just really, truly well, to the bottom of his heart believed it. I think you just, you don't even want to let another option be yeah. an option. One of the detectives who was interviewed in the Forensic Files episode said, like, I wasn't about to tell the family that I didn't think she was alive. That's right. not my place to say it until we have, you know, the proper evidence, even though statistically, probably she was not alive. Um, <sighs> so I imagine that hope has to live somewhere, you know. Yeah. So, of course, this is an impossibly heartbreaking blow for the family. In the end, Donald was found, of, uh, found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. And in the wake of the vicious crime, Katie's family lobbied for legislature changes they hoped would prevent similar crimes in the future. So the goal was to tighten laws on monitoring convicted sex offenders, especially to prevent them from changing their legal names, which I think mm. is really interesting. And uh, the governor signed something called Katie's Law into effect in 2000, only a year later, which applied stricter rules to sex offenders. And it also extended the mandatory minimum sentence for first degree sex crimes. And oh, wow. like, just to give you an idea, this fucking asshole had been on a rampage for years and he really? had been back out. Yeah, he had abducted two teenage girls and tied them to a tree 
and they escaped. And when they reported it, he got basically like a slap on the wrist. So anyway, it's just like so infuriating if you hear like his full backstory. I mean, essentially, it's just a number of sex crimes that were not taken as seriously as they should have been. Oh my God. Like this guy shouldn't have been out and about, you know. So the state also raised $12 million for technology that would help advance video evidence and other crime scene investigative tools. Hmm. Over the years, Donald maintained his innocence and the story of his false confession made under the influence of his mystery prescription drugs, uh, despite all the evidence that mounted against him, uh, a.k.a. Kathy's testimony, his wife lying on his behalf, uh, the truck, and Katie's tooth being in his fucking fire pit. Like, I don't know do how it. much more evidence you need than that. Yeah. Uh, His wife actually later testified and said she had lied um, because she was afraid of him, which I'm like, well, I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So Donald Blum died in prison earlier this year, uh, actually last month, January 10th, 2023. He was 73 years old and he had served 23 years of his life sentence. A crime reporter exchanged several letters with Donald over the years, hoping to one day extract a second confession and a motive from him. She said, I kept thinking for years, maybe he would finally tell me he did it or give me details, but he stuck to his story that he didn't do it. So basically until his dying day, he refused to give any more information. Gross. Which is, you know, it does also, like you mentioned Israel Keys, it reminds me of that case as well, because Israel Keys died by suicide before he could give any of his victims' families any information or answers. So he basically took them to the grave, which is just such a low blow you know it's such an i don't i mean there's like no like it's such a twisted sentence any way you put it but it's like at least like if you're gonna do something that fucked up like own it and like be right proud of it and like share it with the world what you're capable of so that way we can at least hear what the fuck happened yeah at least at least like at least like have the balls to do that at least have, like exactly it's so be able cowardly. to say what you did it's so cowardly to go to your grave and not give them at least the knowledge of what happened it's just it's horrible Mm. so he never he never uh never admitted it uh in 1999 katie's mom talked about the way katie's memory followed her she said everywhere i turn it's katie everywhere i am it's katie it is going to be hard for me thinking of her taking care of me now rather than me taking care of her Today, Katie is still remembered by those who knew her as a joyous, loving, compassionate girl who didn't get the chance to lead the life she was meant to have because this bastard just flippantly took her away. On a whim. On a whim, just took her away. So that's the story of Katie Poyer, which is very heartbreaking. Oh, and I meant to mention also, um, I guess I forgot this bullet in here, but um, they also, the company she worked for, which I believe was Conoco, uh started a mandatory buddy system uh yeah. for closing shifts yeah i think that's um not a bad call i think Definitely. it should be i think it should be a, across the board um a, a especially for gas stations or rest stops where like it's already dark and it's 24/7 and people can come in and i mean i just i've never had to work at a gas station but i imagine you deal with a lot of bullshit and a lot of that is probably dangerous totally and And you think about people coming through just driving through sort of like what you said of not everyone who goes to a local gas station off the freeway is local like there are people driving through that will never be seen again you know there's an added element of danger there too Hmm. so wowza yeah this was a kind of a well for us kind of a quickie episode but I, uh, finally we figured I know. out how to stop talking it feels for good five it feels like so compact <laughs> well, oh good well hey okay well let's end on a high then everyone please go uh come to our shows yes! if you um are if you are coming I, I we hope to see you there and hopefully you enjoy all we've been working really hard on and mm-hmm. if you are a member of patreon you can also go check out our after chat that's about to be posted right after this and uh yeah we'll see you over there and can't wait that's why we drink. <laughs> <laughs>